Well, brothers and sisters, I got a couple questions for you as I do not trip over the uh, chords there. Um, first is, um, when was the last time you confused law and love? Um, and probably most of us are thinking right now, oh, probably never because those things are really different. I'll explain that in just a moment. And the follow-up question is this, how does Jesus show his love for you? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. It brings all things to existence, brings faith into our hearts. Bring that word to work in us all over again right now in this moment uh, to, to be people that follow you, to be people that are filled with your love and people that love our neighbors. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. So, uh, fun thing about Romans 13, um, it's about law and love. And if you read the first seven verses, which we did not read today, um, I invite you to go back and read verses 1 to 7, and it's all about the government, right? The government's role, how God has uh, set up authorities uh, around the world, and, um, and that's what they do. And if, if they don't, you know, allow uh, for the gospel or, or for the word to, then, then there's maybe room to resist. But otherwise, it's, it's authorities got to set up. And guess what? We're not the, those authorities, right? The church is not the government. We don't make law, right? Uh, but we are given the law and the gospel. And sometimes we get those confused, right? Sometimes we confuse the things God uh, calls and commands us to do with the love that we have received from him. And uh, <clears throat> I love that I'm the, the one that gets to talk about things getting confused um, as the oldest person on staff. Um, and the one with ADD. I'm <laughs> sure more, more of us have it, but I, I know I'm officially diagnosed. I don't know about anybody else. So, um, and, and I get confused real easy, right? Um, I, when I go to Cabela's or Ace, I mean, or really any hardware store or outdoor store, anything that has something to do with something outdoors, um, my uh, hunting and gathering quickly goes into recon, right? I, I have my list. I even have, sometimes it's written out, sometimes it's in a text, in a te text, wow, from my lovely wife. Sometimes it's in one of those reminder apps where I can like check each one off as I go get it. Um, and as I'm going through the aisle at Aldi, any Aldi shoppers here, you go through that like, you know, it's not going to last that long. I'm like, we well, need seven of these, um, you know. Uh, I, when I'm, you know, at an outdoor place, I'm like, oh, I didn't know Carhartt was going to be on sale today. I need a coat and boots and a shirt, maybe pants. Um, the coolers, I mean, you always need a new cooler. Those things are always wearing out, right? And grills, I mean, my grill is dirty. And it would be, I mean, I could clean it, but it'd be so much easier just to buy a new one, right? Um, so it's easy to, to get distracted. It's easy to get, to get lost and turn around. And uh, then all of a sudden I remember, oh, well, what was I here for? Oh, what time is it? I need to go. And so I, I need reminders to remind me where I am and what I'm supposed to be doing there. Sometimes God's church, we, we struggle with the same thing. We, for, we forget what we're here to do or sometimes who we're here for. Um, and uh, there's a, an author by the name of Nick, Nicholas Healy. Um, he's uh, critiquing another theologian, and he says this theologian kind of encapsulates uh, God's church describing it this way, uh, saying this other theologian says it's a fit for only faithful Christians, that is, for heroes and saints, for super disciples, the ex extraordinarily obedient, the successful, the satisfactory, people who can live up to the name, right? That's who the church is for. And then Healy has this critique of that thought. He says um, that the church ought to be a home and haven for the unsatisfactory Christians and that our doctrine of the church ought to reflect that. Another uh, author, he's a, a blogger, PhD from Yale, a professor at Abilene Christian University, and taking this thought from Healy about um, unsatisfactory Christians, uh, he says this, it's often what I have in mind when I refer to normie Christians, 
ordinary believers, most of whose days are filled with the mundane tasks of remaining decent while doing what's necessary to survive in a hard world. Uh, he goes on to describe what that's like. He says, uh, working a boring job, feeding the kids, getting enough sleep, paying the bills, not getting into too much debt, occasionally seeing friends, fixing household or familial problems, maybe taking an annual vacation, maybe. And it's into this, it's into this all hands on deck, eking out a survival life that being Christian is somehow supposed to fit, not only seamlessly, like without much disruption, but in a transformative way. He goes on to write this. This is Brad East writing. He says, the church has to make room for the unsatisfactory, the just getting by, that I'm barely paying the bills, that I took it, that it took all I had to show up this morning, that I'm doing my best, the just give me a break, folks, the Holly Ivy Christians who begrudgingly show up twice a year, the uh, Kitchen Heroes and Simon Peters and Doubting Thomases, the addicts who relapse, the gamblers and debt, the porn addict who can't quit the foreclosed on and laid off, the perennially fired and out of work, the ex-cons, the adulterers, and fathers, uh, by, uh, fathers of five kids by three different moms. Is the church not for the, such as these, he, he writes. And then he closes it with a quote from Jesus from Matthew 21, where he writes, truly I say to you, tax collectors and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. How can that possibly be, right? Isn't the game to do things right, live well, be a person of integrity, and you'll enjoy God's glorious riches, right? I mean, that's, think about where you work or where you go to school. There are standards you have to hit in order to progress, to get a, uh, a promotion at work, to go to the next grade, to pass an assignment, to complete a project. There are laws you are supposed to obey on the road, right? Come on, Michigan. <laughs> we can do it. I know we can. Uh, um, but all these are standards that we are supposed to hit. And that is how this world operates. That's how our lives function. But Christ calls us and frees us to live in a different way, a different mindset, a different way of life. And so uh, this is what Jesus is calling his disciples, his people, his body, his, his church, not to do, but to believe. He's calling you to believe his word. So when he says in John 13 and 15, two different times, but he says the same thing, love one another as I have loved you, you will believe that. And so having these words from Jesus, the law of love from Jesus, as it comes through in Romans chapter 13, I want you to think about three things as we move forward. One, uh, love, or the law does not define you. The law does not define you. Love defines you, and love frees you to live for your neighbor. So law, the law does not define you, love defines you, and love frees you to live for your neighbor. So when we talk about how the law defines you, or the law, does, sorry, wow, the law does not define you. See, it's easy to get confused right away. That's what we fall into. I'm a sinner just like everybody else. Um, when we're talking about how the law does not define you, we're talking about God's relationship with humans, right? And he gave us laws. And uh, some, some people might ask, why would God give us laws if he knew we would never keep them? But we see this all throughout is the history, the story of the Bible, the story in our own lives. God gives us laws. Christ gave his disciples commands. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. If God knows we couldn't keep that, why would he do it? Uh, and we see the story of God with, Abra with Adam and Eve and their descendants, Abraham and his descendants, the children of Israel, and God leading them from slavery to freedom. 
And all God says to them initially is, I will be your God, you will be my people. And all God's people said, all right, that was a little bit better. Not bad, 1130. We're going to try it again, though. All God's people said, there we are. Until okay, it was like Sunday afternoon, right? And like, I mean, sometimes my neighbor's awkward and weird, and it's really hard to relate to them. So I'm just going to do my own thing inside today because I just don't have the energy, right? It's just, it's really hard. Um, I know you're my God and I'm your person, but, you know, I'm, I'm just not feeling it today, right? And fast forward to a month later after all God's people said amen, and then they made up a new God because Moses and God were taking too long in the mountain. They're like, we don't know what's happening. We're going to do this instead, right? How long does it take you or me to do something else? other than what God has called and commanded us to do, right? Um, and so the, this word from Paul uh, in verse 12 of chapter 13, right? Uh, it says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, which is a good thing, right? The night is almost done. Like you're, you can see on the horizon that the light is almost, like it's not, it's not the sun. The sun hasn't risen yet. It's not the sun rise, but the light is starting to crack there. You can tell the night's almost over. It's not quite morning, but it's coming, and it's coming soon. And so Paul says, so then let us cast off works of darkness. And that means, uh, the, the first part means that Jesus is coming back. When night is almost done, the, the day is almost here, that means Jesus is almost going to return. He's coming soon. And so then Paul says, because of that, let us cast off deeds of darkness. Great. How do we do that? Right? Maybe, I mean, sometimes we'd like to think it's like Spider-Man 3. And for those of you who loathe movies and superhero illustrations, please forgive me. But Spider-Man 3, arguably the worst of the Spider-Man movies. And God bless you. Those of you who have had to listen, this is your third time listening to it, brothers. My condolences. But in Spider-Man 3, Spider-Man is overcome by this thing called venom, which is like this dark alien substance that makes him do evil things, really. And so he finally figures this out, and he's trying to struggle and remove this dark venom from him, and he can't until, as he's going through the struggle in a bell tower, the bell starts to ring, and now all of a sudden this energy and resounding, this resounding energy gives him the edge he needs to overcome this, this darkness that's uh, trying to invade him. And, uh, and wouldn't you know, he wins. If only it were that easy. Christ tells us that from the heart, all dark thoughts, words, and actions come. It's from our hearts, not from, from, from some foreign place, from something outside of us, something that's alien to us. It's from me. Well, if my heart is the source of my darkness, how do I defeat that? And that's why God gives us laws to show us, to reveal to us. And if it weren't God, we'd make our own laws. We do. And all of them are lesser versions of what God has given. We're trying to soften the edge of the law so maybe then we can actually do it. But even then, we're still inconsistent. Even when we write our own laws. Nothing, there's nothing we can do to hit that. And that's where Jesus comes in <laughs> via Martin Luther. Um, because the church was getting things confused in Luther's time too. Um, and so he, he wrote the 95 Theses, right? Then a year later, he had the Heidelberg Disputation. He wrote a bunch of theses. It's kind of like 95 Theses 2.0, right? And he wrote, a few of them, we're going to look at one today, half of one right now that says, from the heart, nope, uh, the next verse, please, thank you. Uh, the law says, do this, and it is never done, right? So when God commands you to do something, it will always be there for you to do. Uh, how many of you like to do the dishes at your house? Oh, <laughs> 
Some of you love it, and I, I am inclined to believe it. Um, growing up, we didn't have a dishwasher. My parents would say, we have four dishwashers. Why would we buy one? And, and so I would imagine growing up, like, once I'm on my own or I have a family, we'll have a dishwasher, and it will be great. And we do, and all of us hate to empty it or start it. Right? So no matter what it is, the thing that we set before us to do, at some point, we will always hate to do it, right? We'll always fail at wanting to do it, or we'll only do it so it gets done, not out of love, but just for the sake of getting it done. And so this is uh, how we illustrate this concept that the law says, do this, and it's never done. But Paul points out a realization uh, that Christ gave to him. And that's what we need. We need not just an energy from a resounding bell, but we need a voice from outside us to, to proclaim to us something different than what we already know, that we're sinners who can't live up, that we're not enough, and that we're worse than normies, right? We need a voice to remind us, of, to tell us of what God has done about our sin, that he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He does forgive us. And Paul says that in a few places, one of which is in Romans chapter 6, 14, where he writes, you, know, you no longer live under law, but under grace. Paul can write that because of what Jesus has done. Because of that, because of what Christ has done, and if you have faith, uh, it's been given to you by the work of God, it's something he has done in you, it is a gift then you have what Christ has done for you. And so the law no longer defines you. Jesus fulfilled the law in love for you. So you no longer live under that law, but under grace. You're free. You're free from the law. You're free from its expectations. Jesus has fulfilled all of that for you. Does that mean he will come and do your dishes? We'll get to that because he will, but kind of. But when, love's, when love defines you, when love defines you, it's because of God's, the same love that God showed Adam and Eve when he didn't kill them. The same love he showed Abram when he was worshiping an idol, that's when God called him. It's the same love that God showed Israel when they were faithless over and over and over again. And continually, God kept coming to them, kept sending people to speak his word to them so that voice from outside would penetrate their dark hearts and remind them of who they are and who God is. And when that happens, Life changes. When love defines you, your life does change. It's, it's like this in an article by uh, Gina Cherilis, a New York Times article. She writes about the New York City libraries no longer collecting fines. And if any of you had to guess how much a New York City, li how much the New York City library system would collect in one year from library fines, what would you guess? And you guys can't because you already know. I saw your eyes, brother. I knew what you were doing. Three million dollars. And all of a sudden, they're just like, yeah, we don't need it. <laughs> and here's why. Tony Marks explains why they did that. He works for the New York City Library. He says this. He says, we are not in the fine collection business. We're in the encouraging to read and learn business. And we were getting in our own way. Does that sound like you sometimes? I know it sounds like me sometimes. And sometimes it does sound like God's church, where we get in our own way. We shoot ourselves in the foot in the manner we try to carry out the mission of God that he's calling us to do. And uh, Cheryless writes this, when that happened, when they lifted the ban, could you imagine, do any of you, all right, and nobody's going to turn you in today, okay? Like, but do any of you have anything from the libraries you've kept and held on to for sentimental reasons and it's incurred a ridiculous fine and you're too ashamed to turn it in, right? There's a lot of guilt and shame associated with keeping library stuff. 
And then all of a sudden, those fines are gone. It doesn't matter anymore. Cherilus writes that the treasures rolled in along with notes of apology and gratitude. It was not the threat or the weight of the fine that moved people to repent and return what wasn't theirs, but the stuff that they held on to. It was kindness. It was grace. It was freedom that set them free. And not only to apologize in written form, but to express gratitude for that freedom. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, the kindness of God leads you, moves you to repentance. It wasn't his wrath. It's not the threat of eternal damnation. It's his love for you in Christ that sets you free and helps you see what sin is because you now you know and you experience what love is. When love defines you, you begin to believe. You begin to believe that uh, what Jesus says might actually be true. You begin to believe that sin is what it is. It's something that separates you from God and ruins communities. And you begin to believe that Jesus when he says his life and death and resurrection are yours, they are truly yours. Even though you still daily struggle against sin and one day, unless Jesus returns, you will die. But we no longer fear those things. Those things no longer have any control or power or threat over you because Christ has fulfilled all of that. He sets you free from all that. He's given you a promise. You know where you're going and you know what's going to happen at the end of all things. Because the future that belongs to Christ, he gives to you. So where there is fear and doubt, God gives you hope and faith and love. You begin to believe that when he gives you these things freely, that they are truly free, that you do not need to sacrifice your life to because Jesus sacrificed himself for you and and gave you these things freely. Your sacrifice back to Jesus doesn't make those things any more yours. They're already yours. And then you begin to see, when love defines you, you begin to see your neighbors as someone for whom Jesus lives. And if Jesus lives, if he suffered and died and lives for them, maybe he's calling me to do the same thing. Maybe he's calling me, instead of sacrificing my life for Jesus, he's calling me to sacrifice my life for my neighbor. So when love defines you, Love frees you to live for someone else, to live for your neighbor. But we still have these hearts, these hearts of darkness walking around inside of us. Right? We've got the light of God. He's given us faith. He's given us the spirit, which is great. He has redeemed us. And we still sin. We've got both things living together. So what do we do with that? When, especially when things get confused and we start thinking that once again, we can get right with God by doing this stuff on our own. We confess that. We, we believe Jesus when he says, yeah, that's not a thing. I already did that. You, you don't need to do that anymore. What you can do are those things for your neighbor though. Because those commands God gives you, Paul was right when he wrote, love fulfills the law. And our, my love on my own, your love on your own, beautiful as you are, and I'm very grateful for you. It's not enough. It will never be. It's unsatisfactory, right? And so Jesus doesn't just take what we lack and make up for it. He replaces what we can never do with what only he can do. 
And so uh, when we confuse God's love with the law, and we use either the law or love or both as a weapon to injure our neighbor, to hurt them instead of heal them, to leave them alone in shame and darkness instead of sending, setting them free. And we gotta confess that. And when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us from all, all unrighteousness. The law of love is not about, this is, I heard this from another pastor. Um, he says, uh, or a, a priest actually, he says that the law of love is not about being or doing something. It's about proclaiming something to yourself. Yeah, you need to, that word of God. Sometimes I read it out loud, usually when I'm by myself because otherwise people think I'm weird, weirder than I already am. But I need to remember, I need to be taught, I need to instruct my own soul in the truths of God. My neighbors do too. And how do I instruct my neighbors? Isn't that a little presumptuous? Oh, it could be very presumptuous. That's right, assuming you have free license to use the word of God however you want, instead of having a conversation with your neighbor to learn who they are, to learn their story, to learn how God has already been at work in their life, what they've faced, what they are facing, and how God might be speaking differently through you to them. Christ laid down his life for you so that in the freedom he gives you, you lay down your life for your neighbor. It looks like this. Um, back when we moved to Port Huron, oh, that was a while ago. I was a young man then. <laughs> our, our oldest was, uh, wasn't even two, and uh, we moved in next door to a guy named Mike. And um, just looking at my wife, it's bringing tears in the eyes. Anyway. Anyway, Mike, uh, Mike Charles, and uh, he would just love us and love us well. Uh, he'd come over every so often. He'd talk with Julia and Lisa um, every so often, checking in on them. Um, there's one time he took us out on his boat in Lake Huron. And to take a boat in Lake Huron, it can't really be like a simple fishing boat, right? You've got to have something a little more substantial to handle the waves and I mean, we would never have gone on Lake Huron if it wasn't for Mike, at least at that time in our lives for sure. And so Mike gave us access to an experience we never would have had. And he showed us love just because we live next to him, right? For no other reason. That's the kind of love God is calling you to give and to speak into the lives of your neighbors. It can be to something amazing as laser tag at the lawn party. Or it could be a conversation over coffee at the cup or somewhere else, like your home. Or it could be recognizing that there's a mom who's having a human experience. And it would be great to not have her kids in her house for just a little bit, right? She loves her kids dearly, but sometimes she needs a break. And there can be simple things we can do to show love to our neighbors. It could be a hall, somebody that lives in your building, your apartment, somebody you're in class with, somebody you're doing research with that just needs someone to acknowledge their existence. I learned this recently too. Sometimes people just need space. They're around people all the time. They just need space to recoup on their own. So giving someone the space to do that can be a way you serve Christ and serve and by serving your neighbor. The church is, was, and always will be a gathering of beggars telling other beggars where the bread is, right? We haven't figured out something magical on our own. God has shown us what we need. He's spoken to us what we need. We are saints who still sin forgiven by Jesus. We are normies here for other normies because Christ took all the, all the ways we were not enough and gave, you, gave us an extraordinary new life. 
that has lived out in some exceptional moments, but also in the mundane, in the day-to-day, and the details that make up those days. And for a world that's lost in darkness where there are never enough, we get to come and tell them, you don't have to be. And the message you give them, that, that you are there for them, Christ gives to you. I will be with you in those conversations. I will be with you in the extraordinary and the mundane. I will be with you until the end of the age and also in the day to day. So let us live because love defines us now. Let us live because Love sets us free to live for our neighbors. And let us believe that because he lives, you too will live. And that's what Paul means when he says, put on Christ in his name. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for neighbors. Thank you for people who show us things we could never see on our own. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to reciprocate to do the same. Whether it's for someone that, uh, that has done that for us or someone that hasn't, Lord, we get to do what you have done for us. You set us free. You speak your word into our hearts. God, use us to do that, to walk alongside people in this world, to be people of faith in a world of darkness. In your name we pray, amen.